postdoc in the Center for Research and Extreme Scale Technology, press, which used to be known as the Good Systems Lab, which is Andy Lumstein's lab in computer science. And as a hobby, for about two years now, I've been doing uh, open source 3D printing, and for a little longer than that, I've been doing Arduino stuff. And I've been teaching Arduino and a half now. Uh, actually, more like two years, I guess, uh, in different contexts. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about 3D printing and hopefully give you a demo because 60% of the time it works every time. <laughs> and we'll see if the pretty 3D printing gods are with us today. Um, if not, I'll show you some videos uh, mm -hmm. that are cool. Um, I got some cool cat videos and stuff. Or cat pictures, at least. Uh, so right now I am um, heating up the printer. This is a MakerBot thingomatic. I've got another printer on the way uh, called the MakerBot Replicator, which is the newest, uh, latest version of this. Um, I've got a couple other printers. I have a MakerBot Cupcake, which is the first generation printer, which I don't have here today. And then this is a RepRap Prusa Mendel. Um, and then I'll have a Replicator. Uh, just to give a plug for the 3D printing club, I run it on Sundays at 2 p.m. in Lonely Hall, room 101. Everyone's free to stop by and hang out. All right, so I'm using some software here called Replicator G, which is free software. Um, this was started by folks that make about basically, or the RepRap folks. Um, and I'm just trying to, to warm up the printer. Right now, the way the 3D printer works, the way this 3D printer works, is it heats up plastic using this print head. The plastic melts, turns into a liquidy form, and is extruded as a, like a stringy material, which we'll see in a minute. Um, and that's laid down, layer at a time, onto the heated build platform. The build platform is heated so that the plastic doesn't come off of it, because plastic starts cooling down immediately after leaving leaving the extruder and it tends to start flexing and changing the shape and all that. So you can see it's starting to cool a little. That's a good sign. The plastic I'm printing in today is called PLA, polylactic acid. It is the reason I'm not printing in this plastic is that I don't want you to be overcome with fumes. Um, <laughs> this this ABS plastic, which is what Legos are made of, is extremely strong. Uh, however, it gives off some pretty nasty fumes. Uh, after giving a demo at elementary school, the kids are getting woozy. It's like, ah, you know, it's time, to, time to learn how to print in PLA. PLA is infamous for being difficult to print with because uh, unlike ABS, which is a solid at room temperature, this is actually a gel. And when it turns into liquid form, it's actually uh, a transition that requires um, a lot of heat. It sucks a lot of heat out of the extruder. So it's very possible for the um, plastic to suck enough heat out of the extruder that it cools it down and the print that jam. So um, somehow, you know, sometimes you could be printing, you could do a print that takes four hours and three and a half hours, it just stops working for a minute and the print's ruined. So um, it's just been very recently that I've figured out how to print with this stuff at all. Um, but I'm going to try to print uh, something for you. I'm going to try to print a whistle. And the whistle, if it comes out, will be like this, and it'll actually be a working whistle. But it doesn't work that well. <laughs> um, I had some other whistles, but I think some elementary school kids stole it when I gave a demo last week. So uh, anyway, I've got better whistles. Um, this whistle design, I print using this design usually. And the reason is it prints the little ball inside of it in one pass. Um, the problem is the plastic is so strong, and the way it prints is it prints that ball attached to the wall, the bottom wall of the whistle. It's almost impossible to remove the ball from the side of the wall. It's just the plastic's way too strong. So um, I was printing the other design, and I literally just couldn't. No matter what I did, I couldn't get the ball off. So this plastic, these plastics are very strong. Like I could um, here's some robot pieces. I could probably drive my car over this robot piece. 
And if you ever stepped on a Lego, you know, <laughs> you know how strong it is. Uh, so anyway, let me pass around some of these pieces. And here's a pawn that we printed the other day, and here's a face, and here's some reporters. Uh, as far as the whistles go, just be aware that a bunch of elementary school kids have been blowing on these whistles. <laughs> Yes. So you said that the plastic you're printing with right now is not a solid at room temperature? Um, it's considered a gel. And I don't know what a gel is. There's some chemist here probably. Like, it's, okay. It goes through some weird phase transition. It's all I've read. So I don't know anything about it. I'm just a humble printer <laughs> operator. I don't know tech stuff. Well, yeah. <laughs> are, but, are these or? Okay, so when you look at these pieces, um, the, all the ABS pieces are translucent because the ABS I have right now is all translucent. So if it's colored, and I think the only colors I have right now are the, the yellow stuff, then it's ABS. And you can you can tell the difference. Uh, the PLA is like a stickier type material, so it just has different material properties. And it's not like one plastic is better than the other. You know, they just have different properties, and you might use them for different things. Um, oh, and I'll pass around uh, this robot, which is. Uh, named Spazzy, and this is a robot, so, so when uh, Lindsay and Alex got married, uh, they wanted a dancing robot at the wedding, um, so this is a 3D printed dancing robot, and this was designed by um, uh, a guy named Merrick, who, who designed the Keybon robot, if you're familiar with that. So these are all 3D uh, printed pieces, and um, I don't have them hooked up right now, but uh, it's kind of cool to watch dance to the beat. Um, okay, so let's see if uh, see if we can uh, do a little test extrusion. So on that temperature, I, I normally print it around. I like to print around 208 uh, C with the PLA, and we have to cross our fingers here to see if that actually works or if it's jammed. Uh, try a little test extrusion. Chance to watch me repair it. <laughs> it took me about a year to learn how to operate these machines um, reliably. The machines are getting better. Half of it's hardware, half of it's software. Okay, so it looks like I'm able to extrude. Now I'll try a two second extrusion. Yay! Five second extrusion. I mean, these printers like almost never catch on fire anymore. I mean, it's really, uh, yeah. It's so pleasing when it works. Right, let's try a thirty second extrusion. Yeah, and, and for about a year, that's all I was able to do is like print out the string. Sometimes. So we're 90% of the way there if we can print out the string. That's good. Let me see Grab this. Do another. I see the plastic's done a little, so I'm going to go ahead and do a one minute extrusion so I get past that point. And then we'll kick it off. We'll, uh, in fact, let me get the uh, G code ready to make sure it's all ready. All right. Here's the string. Pass that around. You can check that out. That's what it looks like. Um, doesn't look very impressive until you have to introduce a computer to control it.
Okay, so that's uh, my family's cat in South Carolina, Shuggy. And my dad is a, an artist, so he made this cat sculpture. Shuggy. And I took this to IUPUI and had this scan using a structured light scan, which is basically a projector that projects a pattern of lights, you know, lines or a grid, and then you have a camera that watches how the grid changes as the pattern changes. Um, and from that, and by moving the object around, you can get a 3D structure. So I was able to get a 3D scan of the cat. And using that, I was able to print out a cat, so this was part of the cat. Um, let's see if I can find the cat. Okay, so here's like, it's kind of dark, but that's, the, that's a cat. Um, so that it kept my hand, I gave that away some kids too. So. Anyway, so that's like the printed cat on top of the cat. So then what I did was, um, I'm a founding member of Blooming Lab, which is a hacker space in, in, uh, in Bloomington. And uh, the folks in Blooming Labs made uh, a table for doing a vacuum forming, plastic vacuum forming. So I took my uh, printed plastic cat and made a vacuum form mold of it. And then I cast and soap um, my cat. So I've got cat soap now. Pass <laughs> um, that around. Oh. Hey, Bill. Yeah. How long did it take to scan the cat? Are you A long time. It? Okay. It's the, the scanning, all this stuff is like more complicated than it looks. Sure, okay. sure. Don't um, believe it. The, the scanning took a long time because with the scanning, once you scan it, first of all, it took like a long time just to scan it. It took like an hour or something. It took much longer than I expected. Um, the scanning process is, even if you use a laser scanner, structure light, whatever, like high-end commercial scanners, there are problems with any reflective surfaces. You'll get all sorts of new reflections even with the laser scanner. So we also took a guitar up there and we couldn't scan it at all. It just didn't work. Um, when you scan someone's head with like a $30,000 handheld laser scanner, if they've got like, you know, dreadlocks or something, you have to put cornstarch on that so you can scan it, because otherwise it won't pick up. So there are all sorts of things like that. And then once you get the mesh, you have to take the different scans and merge the mesh together and like clean it up and everything. It's a post process. So it's, um, I think it's becoming a lot easier. All this technology is becoming easier, but. It's not trivial. It's not like, at least with any sort of equipment we could possibly afford, uh, it's not like, hey, mm -hmm. no, it works right. So scanning an actual living cat, not working with <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, let's see how we're doing here. Okay, we extruded. It seems like the plastic's not bent. Got some more string. Yay, this is like a collector's item. I used to have like this all, I just had a bunch of string next to my Pez dispensers, you know, I was like, hey, that's, that's my thousand dollar investment for you. Okay, so here we go. Let's try printing. Oh, whistle. <laughs> if it starts printing, probably it'll finish. <laughs> So this is going to take uh, 34 minutes. That's once it lays down the wrap. So, well, can you talk about the maker about it? Like itself? Like how does it work? Or did you build it from a kit? Or this is a kit, it? and uh, I built this. Actually, my students built this with me uh, in a 3D printing club. Probably in the weekend. I'm working with a teacher in Indianapolis who's a middle school technology teacher, and he's been working on one for a year. And sort of every couple of weekends he comes down and we work on it. Um, I mean, I built it in a weekend with some friends because I've already built one before, so it's a lot easier. Uh, there are people at MakerBot Industries who can build one of these, I think, in four hours, like single handedly. Uh, so, you know, it is possible to, to build this quickly. This, this technology is advancing very rapidly and dropping in price, but still we're at the very beginnings of, of uh, 
but this is still very much in the hobbyist realm. Okay, so I would compare this to the personal computer industry circa 1975, 76. Okay, so Mitz Alter, one of the earliest computers that was a kit, you had to solder it together. Um, the Apple One computer didn't come with a power supply or a keyboard. Okay, uh, you had to supply those. That's sort of where we are with these kits. We're still waiting for our Apple One. Uh, that might be the replicator, maybe, because that's put together. It's one of the few printers you can get that's affordable and very put together. Yeah. So, as somebody who uses, who, who's a, a you know an avid user of this technology, can you give your opinion on like the future of this technology? Um, yeah, I can say some things about what I think will happen uh, for sure, and some things that I think might happen. Uh, some things I think I hope will happen, and other things I hope won't happen that might. Um, I think what will definitely happen is this technology will continue to improve at the hobbyist level and also at the commercial level. Two big things driving the technology, or two big areas, are the biomedical field, where people are printing out blood vessels, um, printing out organs. There are people who, for the last decade, have walked around with a bladder printed on a 3D printer. Basically, they take cells, culture them, and then put them in basically an inkjet cartridge and print that out with three-dimensional shape. Um, people are working on trying to print out um, livers or kidneys. I don't know. One of those things. Okay, that's a harder problem, right? Um, but the biomedical field is advancing very quickly. There are several startups that have real money. They're involved in this uh, sort of regenerative medicine type aspect. That's going to drive things very clearly. Another big area is aerospace. So there are printers now, uh, like laser centering printers, that can actually print in stainless steel. They can print in titanium. There are printers that can print in ceramic, glass, so forth. Um, so if you can print directly in titanium and you can print any shape, then you can print very, very strong, very lightweight structures that are extremely complicated. So. Uh, in the aerospace industry, if you're building a jumbo jet and you need to have a big titanium part that's complicated, you have to design the part not just to serve its purpose on the airplane, but you have to design it in such a way you can actually manufacture it. And usually what that means is doing something like CNC milling, where you have a big block of titanium or a big block of aluminum, and you have a milling head that comes in from different angles. But it's very difficult for that milling head to get to certain angles, so you have to design the piece larger, you have, uh, you have to use more material, it's more expensive and it's heavier than if you could just print it arbitrarily using a nice printer. So the aerospace industry is very, very interested in this technology. In fact, one of the things, that, and, and that's the source of some startups, uh, one thing that the aerospace industry would love is like a 40-foot printer that you could put on a wing and print, you know, control rods and control surfaces and things like that, the ailerons in place on the wing. Um, whether or not that will happen, I don't know, but certainly uh, there are industries that are spending a lot of money uh, to try and improve this technology. Uh, one area this has been reused for a long time is in prototyping and product development. So if you have a plastic case for your cell phone, chances are it was printed out originally on a 3D printer as uh, some sort of designer was trying to iterate their design. More recently, as the prices have come down, the printers have become more capable, uh, people have talked about a new industrial revolution based on mass customization. So the idea is just like if you buy a computer from Dell, right, you can say, I want this hard drive, this video card, you know, um, this power supply, so forth, right? Uh, it wasn't always like that. It used to be, hey, you want a computer? Here's the three models of that. Uh, and I think, at least in some areas, the same thing will very much become true of manufactured objects. You want a case for your phone, customize it any way you want because we're going to 3D print it for you. And, you, know, you want to have My Little Pony characters on it? Fine. You, know, you want to design your own characters? Whatever. Um, so, so this will unleash, I think, a lot of customization and creativity in products that Traditionally, you just had to, you know, you had a few choices, but you couldn't actually design things yourself. Just like um, the invention of 
desktop publishing allowed many more people to write books, uh, and they, you know things like social networking and Facebook and so forth have allowed people to express themselves in ways that more people can see. I think this mass customization will allow sort of everyone who is computer literate to be able to you know, kind of personalize their own their own uh, you know, objects in their lives to, to a much greater degree than has ever been seen before. Uh, so those things, I think, are definitely happening right now. One thing that's going to happen, and has started to happen, is there's going to be a huge copyright fight. A huge fight about copyright, a huge fight about patents. And it's already starting to happen. The Pirate Bay now has a 3D printing part of their site. You can download and print a Pirate Bay pirate ship. Um, that won't be the only thing you can download from the Pirate Bay soon, right? Uh, so right now, if you go onto certain websites, or if you go on like Thingiverse, which is the sharing site, you can find um, characters you know, from movies and things like that. And right now, like Disney or Pixar or whoever it is, like they don't really care, right? Because like you know, it's not it's not a big deal if one of these weirdos with a hobbyist level three D printer can you know print out Jar Jar Binks, right? But um, when 10 million people have these printers, or when people can make them rapidly enough to sell them, um, then I think these companies are going to start taking an interest. There are also issues, um, well, actually, <laughs> dare I try connecting now using the Does everyone seem like the IU meme? Yeah. Yes. IU secure, why do you know connect? Disaster, but um, <laughs> let me see if I can connect the thing first. I'll show you some of the things I found. Very interesting. Uh, oh, fail. Oh, wait. Hey. No way. All right. Cool. All right. So here is this website. It's really awesome. And this was uh, uh, created by the MakerBot people. And this is a sharing site for open source designs, like 3D models and things like that. Okay. So, um, let's see if cool. Wearable planner base, that's very bizarre. Paper crimper, that's kind of cool. Uh, yeah, 3D printed pod copter. This is great technology for robotics. This is that's what you're Thor's hammer. Okay, so, um, yeah, here are a bunch of new objects, and, and the site has grown. And you can actually, one of the things you can download and print out are 3D printers. Okay. So this 3D printer was printed on a 3D printer. In fact, it was printed on the same type of design. Uh, so for the RepRaps, you know, you're supposed to build one, get it working, print out the replacement parts is the first thing you do in case it breaks down, you already have the replacement parts. And then you're supposed to print out two printers for two friends. And they're supposed to do the same thing. So you get exponential growth. So their, their motto is um, wealth without money. Which you believe that, you believe anything. But yes, but not all, all of it, right? There's obviously no, not all of it. So, okay. so, so all of these yeah. custom plastic parts, all the plastic parts were printed. Okay. okay. Um, the idea is that the plastic parts, anything weird, you want to print out, and then the rest of the stuff should be stuff that's easily obtainable, like threaded rod you can get at a hardware store, right? Like these nuts and bolts you can get at a hardware store. Of course, there are things like electronics, right? Not so easy to 3D print a circuit board or a transistor. but People were working very hard on that, actually. People were working on ways to print out, uh, or, or, and, that, and that 3D printing is just one of the technology, the family of technologies called digital fabrication. So that includes things like laser cutters, 3D printers, uh, 3D mills, all sorts of things. They're like netting, knitting machines. And when I start making weird noises, I get nervous. Uh-oh. Okay, you all right there? Oh, okay, the plastic is starting to get fucked. These printers don't really like being moved that much. And also, it turns out that this printer does not fit in the overhead bin in an airplane. <laughs> 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 did, did they let you play with that? Oh, yeah. So, uh, the last time I, fr I flew to New York for the World Maker Fair and was in their 3D printing village, and I had read, hey, the MakerBots fit on an airplane. Well, <laughs> That's true with the old version, which was smaller. So I brought this carry-on, 
And then the first flight, I was lucky because there was no one else on the flight. I mean, it, it was a, not very full, so I was able to just put it like on the seat, and no one really helped me. The second flight was completely full, and here I am trying to put it onto the, like the thing, and then it's like, man, I guess I'm gonna have to check this thing, and I'm gonna get back to the kindling. And the pilot was there, and he's like, what is that? It's like, it's a 3D printer, and I saw him and showed him the printed parts. He's like, you're not gonna check that, are you? It's like, well, I guess I'm gonna have to. He's like, hold on. And he goes like in, in the cabin, or sorry, like right behind the cockpit, there's like this big area, uh, closet where all the pilots put their jackets and stuff. And he took all this stuff and throws it into another closet. He takes this and he puts it in there. It's like, wow, that's awesome. He's like, you need to get a case next time. <laughs> like, all right. Um, so anyway, yeah, so you can get a 3D printer to print out. All right, here's what I want to show you. <clears throat> what? Okay, this is what started one of the controversies. So this is a, a parameterized magazine for an AR-15 assault rifle. Um, and it used to be that if you wanted to have a magazine, a high capacity magazine, that that was like regulated by federal law or something. Yet. But I think that's been repealed. I don't know. I, I haven't kept it on. But anyway, this is parameterized. If you want to make a 100 round magazine, just print it up. Um, Okay, so that was the first thing people uploaded. They were like, oh, all right. Uh, people on the site, a lot of them felt uncomfortable, and there was a lot of discussion about it, and then people were like, you're censoring us, you're the root of all evil. So uh, there was this big debate, and then it escalated. So that was just the opening shot, if you will. The, um, here's where it really got serious is the AR-15 lower receiver. So this is the part that's regulated by federal law. Um, and this is how to make it fully automatic. Um, and you might think, well, it's kind of silly to print out like a, a rifle part on a 3D printer, right? That's not going to work. Well, there, there are definitely printers that can print out working versions of this. Because I told you there are printers that can print out stainless steel titanium. There's services you can print online. Um, there are also, you know, you can buy AR-15 lower receivers made out of polycarbonate and stuff like that. It's strong enough that it can be used in, and it's not really um, subjected to huge amounts of stress. So uh, it is possible to print these things out. So this, sorry, go ahead. Can you explain the significance of this thing? Like what, what is this thing and why? My understanding is, is this is the part that goes like, you know, at the bottom of the, basically the M16, and this is where you pick selective fire or three round burst or, fully automatic and you, know, you can modify this design and make it make a semi-automatic weapon in the fully automatic. I think that's the okay. issue. Okay. Um, so if you print this, you can have and you have a uh, now you might I don't know if they'd have to change this design or not. But the idea you know the idea that you have the sharing site and now people are uploading what potentially are functional weapon parts. Um, so how do they make so how would you make it? Yeah. Like how would you no, print I mean, it out? Like, from, like, so they, they, they're designing it. Right? Oh, they're designing it. Okay, so uh, there's all sorts of software. Like if you use, um, for example, uh, Blender. Blender can export STL files. Uh, I use a program called OpenSCAD, which I, I can show you. Um, it's actually very easy to do simple ge geometric shapes. So this actually isn't too hard. I could, you know, my uh, H211 students can model that after showing them for 10 minutes. So that's actually not that hard to model. Um, so this ignited a whole debate. And right now, the folks at Thingiverse are like, well, until we really understand the full implications, we're not going to censor anything prematurely. Because you can already get these things, right? Like, it's not like you can't get weapons. Um, and, and also, the technology, although in theory, at least you can print these out, for most hobbyists, is, is far beyond their capacity. But this is just an example of the sorts of debates that are happening. Um, there are other things, you know, you can find, like... Okay, so... Uh, you can get Gangsta Yoda. <laughs> um, you know, so... I'm sure at some point people will be upset about Gangsta Yoda. Or who knows. Um, there are also, let's say... Um, 
adult entertainment devices that are printable and you can find designs online. And in certain states, they're illegal. Okay, so so there, there, there are um, issues regarding copyright, issues uh, regarding you know, weapons, issues regarding you know, legal aspects. And, and these have yet to be resolved. Um, and people in the open source community, or the open source printing community, are very aware of what's happened with file sharing, for example, right? So it's sort of like, there was this great world that had Napster and all this stuff, and then the record companies woke up, and they dropped the hammer, and there was really no one to talk about the benefits of having you know, remixing culture and sharing and so forth, right? So it's like the copyright holders got all the rights. Bam. So uh, the people in the open source printing world, they know this fight is coming. Uh, there actually have been several Digital Millennium Copyright Act takedown notices against things. Um, so uh, there, there are people with public knowledge, for example, uh, Michael Weinberg, and public, public knowledge, is, um, is working as an advocate to try to educate people in Congress about the positive uses of 3D printing, because this really is marvelous technology. There are, there are misuses of it, there are questionable uses of it, but they're undoubtedly uh, very positive, important uses. And in fact, if you want to compete um, as an industrial country in the 21st century, it's very important that people have access to this technology, we develop it, we encourage the use of it and expertise of this, that kids learn how to use this technology. Um, so, you know, there's a fight coming, but the, the open source community is aware that there's a fight coming, and trying to educate people as to the positive things you can do with the artistic uses, the practical uses, and so forth. Uh, another very positive use, practical use for it, is like replacement parts. Okay, so let's see if I can find a nice. Uh... All right, here we go. So here is a very positive use of. 3D printing, right? So if something breaks in your house, you can print something out. There are printers that, like I said, can print titanium stainless steel. If something breaks on your car, you can print out a part. Or a garage, instead of having to keep inventory of all the parts that you might possibly break in some little town, they'll have a 3D printer. And if something breaks, then say, hey, well, we don't have that part, but we can print for you in two hours, and then we'll install it. Um, once again, this brings up questions of, well, is Honda really going to like it if there's a where site that has, you know, anti-lock brake designs that you can print out at home and put in your car? Um, you know, so, so, you know, there, there are lots of issues that have yet to be addressed. Um, I think that, just to make clear, I think that um, the 3D printing stuff is a force for good and creativity and artistry and you can do amazing stuff with it. And uh, um, I hope Congress will, when this fight comes, will, uh, will be on our side. Um, OK, so let me show you. Oh, yeah, OK, so here, here's some, uh, uh, it's too dark. That's a 10-sided die printed out. A whistle are printed out. That's another whistle. That's a little sculpture. It's kind of hard to see, but it's kind of like an early spring. There's an artist, Bathsheba Grossman, who prints all this crazy math based geometric art that could only be produced by 3D printers. Um, there's no way you could do it by hand. So she's got really cool designs. Uh, this is. Some people you can't see, but uh, those are people who helped put together um, this print. Okay, so how are we doing? It looks okay. Actually, um, if you can avoid tripping on that cord, you might want to take a look to see kind of what's going on here. Right now we're uh, printing out, I think the ball may have been printed. It looks like the ball is mostly done. It's still open right now. Um, but the other thing is I will set this up uh, so that you can see it right after the keynote speaker. So I'll have like a little demo. Um, you can see it, I guess, like in the main area. 
How exactly does it print things like in the open air where so to speak? Like when it goes to close it, it's going to have to go across the top. How does yeah, that not just like follow so, so you have the issue of overhangs, right? And um, for this printer, well, if you've had an overhang, it just tries to do its best, and the plastic will droop a little. And all. Uh, there are other techniques using what's called support material, where you print material that you actually don't want in the final piece, but it supports the other material. And then you get rid of it. So the new printer that I've got coming has two print heads. Um, you can either print multiple colors, multiple materials, or what, it, what I'll most likely be doing is have one uh, print head extruding ABS or PLA for the actual part. And then I'll be extruding a plastic called PDA for the other uh, print head, and that support material, that dissolves in water. So I'll take the piece, throw it in a bucket of water, and then take out the piece that just has the parts I want. And we'll be able to print, you know, basically any shape you can imagine. Um, so that, that will be a big innovation. One issue that has kept the 3D printing um, printers, the open source printer is sort of behind the state of the art, at least right now, are, uh, are patents. So, there are commercial 3D printing companies that have been making these printers for decades, and there are lots of patents for lots of these processes. So like MakerBot Industries, they've got it on their calendar, they've got marked when different patents expire. And when those patents expire, there will be new printers coming out with new technology. So uh, like the laser centering, I think there are a bunch of patents there, and there's UV curing printers, and there's a bunch of stuff like that. Um, really cool technology. All right, so let me show you something else that's cool. Um, let's see how, let's see if this is too dark or it works. Yeah, okay. So, um, folks at MIT have printed out this flute. Uh, so here's the, uh, here's the print flute, I guess. Or no, maybe they're both print flutes. Maybe there's two different versions. They look, they both look print to me. Um, so this, printer was printed using a UV curing mechanism, uh, where you have like a powder that has like this plastic. And actually, this is multiple material plastic. Um, they've got like rubber, they've got plastic. So here's the UV curing process, uh, laying it down a little bit at a time. And this was all printed in one piece. So it wasn't like they printed a bunch of pieces and assembled it. They printed a working flute, and then it was done. Okay. Uh, there are printers that can print out a working engine in one pass, with no assembly. Uh, they're made out of plastic, but since they're processes that you can print, print titanium and so forth, you know, that technology will probably also come. And apparently, it plays very well. There's some problems with some of the, uh, um, you know, the fingering, sticking, or whatever. But yeah, so this is in Rhino. In fact, Nicole Jacquard in the art department teaches a 3D modeling class, and she's using Rhino, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can actually take classes at IU on this. And, and the art department has two high end 3D printers. They've got a gypsum printer that can print in full color, and a high end ABS printer that's sort of like this one. Um, but that can, that can also be support material. Uh, so, the interesting thing is now that the technology for the open source printers is becoming more reliable. Expect, you know, with this new printer, the replicator, I expect that will be mostly hassle-free. You don't have to be an expert in 3D printing, probably, to get that to work reliably. At least you shouldn't be. Um, now that the state of the art in the hardware has advanced to a certain point, now it's much more about design. And that's the cool part, right? Now it's about what can you design um, artistically, what can you design creatively, and what, what sort of uh, functional objects can you design. People are designing 3D printed quadcopters all the time, or 3D printed robots, for example. Um, so, you know, if you can use software to, to design, if you can do 3D modeling, if you've got, you know, good spatial skills or are willing to develop those, uh, you can do amazing things like this. And, and you know, at some point, you know, I'm sure that printer was a super high-end commercial printer that costs a dollars, but at some point, there'll be a hobbyist printer. It might be a couple decades, but there will be. Yeah. What kind of resolution can you, like how fine of detail can you print with these printers? Uh, it depends on the print. So there is as many different printing processes as there are printing companies. So uh, there, there are printers that have extremely fine resolution. 
and there, there's a printer that can print out a house in concrete. It basically, it's got a long pipe, and it can extrude concrete, and the pipe that, you know, the extruding pipe is controlled by a computer and motors, and it can lay out the foundation for a house, including places for the plumbing and uh, for electric wiring in, in a day. And the idea is that this is for, um, you know, disaster relief and some sort of disaster. Relief. So, uh, so this is coming. Um, as far as digital fabrication, yeah, so you can make stuff like that, right? And it can, you know, there's no reason you can't make something. That, in fact, at MIT, the, the Stata Center, their, their computer science building, if you've ever seen it, it's this crazy building, the Frank Gehry building, that has like no two shapes are the same on the building. It's all built using digital fabrication tools, like 3D mills and stuff like that. Um, so, and in fact, I've been working with Nicole Picard and Kyla Kepler in education and uh, Andy Lump saying, your science to try to get a fab lab at IU where we have whole range of digital fabrication devices for students to use, faculty to use, people in the community to use. So we're still working on that. Hopefully uh, that will come. Um, okay, so the other thing I was going to talk about, it's hard to talk about too much at once, um, was Arduino. I'm not really going to talk about that. I, I was just mentioning a few things though. Uh, so Arduino is an open source hardware microcontroller. It's basically a computer on this board, this whole computer. It can talk to your laptop or your regular computer, uh, but it can also talk to hardware. It can talk to servo motors, um, control those. So you know, like here's a big servo motor, can control this type of thing, okay? and can use, be used in robotics. Um, the interesting thing is that both of these printers are actually controlled by Arduino. Okay, so I've been teaching Arduino uh, in an H211 intro computer science class, uh, which Lindsay was the AI for last uh, semester. And I also run an Arduino like hacking club, so we meet uh, Fridays from 6 p.m. to midnight in uh, Lindley Hall, um, 008. In fact, actually, we went until 3 a.m. this morning. I was going to say, it doesn't always end at 3 It doesn't always end, <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, the Arduino stuff is very cool. It's very much related to this printer technology. It's one of the things that enables the low-cost printing. So now, there's off the fact you can get Arduinos in radio check. Okay, so it's sort of the combination of, or the confluence of these different people working in the world of open source hardware that allows you know, things like these open source 3D printers to occur. So, you know, it's uh, having, you know, very low cost, uh, electronics with a big community behind it and programming tools to make it easy for anyone, like artists, to, to program, learn how to program and control things to do robotics, whatever, that uh, has has really dropped the price and complexity of these objects. So uh, that's something to keep your eye out for as you're doing stuff. I'm going to be teaching our general class actually in about two weeks. Uh, but it's full, so you can't get it. So. Uh, anyway, uh, so I was just going to show you there's two things. First of all, we did last night, uh, and then I was going to show you a couple of videos of Arduino projects we did. And I, I don't really see a distinction between Arduino and 3D printing in my mind anymore, just because it's like, <coughs> hey, you do an Arduino project, you might want to control something printed with a 3D printer, animatronic, robotic, whatever, uh, or some device, or maybe even a 3D printer, right? Um, and 3D printing, you're often thinking, well, if I had some electronics to control something, that'd be cooler, I'll just use an Arduino. So it, that they really go together really well. Uh, so last night, uh, I grew up with this beautiful machine, at very 2600, you know, in the late 70s. And there are all sorts of cool uh, cartridges you can get, ROM cartridges. So this has a 4K uh, ROM chip inside, or 2K, or 16K uh, ROM chip. Um, so we've been playing around with Arduino and the Atari stuff. So here's an Arduino Mega. And this is a Pac-Man cartridge. When I was a kid, uh, someone threatened to blow up the local Sears because they want a free copy of Pac-Man. Um, little did they know it was actually a really bad part of the game. But this is an Atari cartridge we took apart. Um, we soldered up the connections and hooked it up to the Arduino. And then last night, um, Eric Holt wrote some software and we dumped the, the ROM so we were able to just read the 
the ROM and uh, dump it to a file and on the laptop. And then I took this Harmony cart, which you can get from Atari Age, has a little SD card on it. So we loaded the ROM on the here, and then we just were able to plug that into my Atari and we were able to play Pac-Man, which is cool. I mean, people do that already. But uh, what we're going to try to do next week is go the other way around. We're trying to make the Arduino pretend to be an Atari cartridge. And if we can succeed in that, then we're going to try to push it further and have the Arduino do some networking where you can have networks. So I've got a couple of Ataris. We're going to have Arduinos uh, networking between Ataris so you'll be able to play like over the internet um, Atari games. So uh, we'll see how well that works. I mean, that's like the dream. The other dream we have is in supercomputing, there's something called the Graph 500. It's sort of like the top 500 list of top 500 supercomputers. This is for the computers that can do graph uh, algorithms fastest and you know, use the top supercomputers in the world. Well, there are only like 40 or 50 entries on the top 500 list. So anyone who completes a benchmark, which you can be any size you want, essentially, um, gets on the top 500 list. So we're going to um, use the Arduino to pretend to be a cartridge uh, and actually run the top 500 benchmarks on the Atari. And then this will be one of the top 500 computers in the world for running <laughs> graph uh, So that's, those are the sorts of things that we do, and I think that's a lot of fun. I'll show you a couple uh, quick things here. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. Uh, this is a 3D printed jellyfish that uh, some of my students made in H211 as their final project. Um, so they printed it, they designed, they designed all this from scratch. So this is Arduino controls. Um, they designed and printed out the body and, and they you know, had to put in like places where all the LEDs would go and then they, they soldered that up. And they have fiber optic cables here and they're also uh, lit by LEDs. And then um, they've got a microphone in there that can like listen to the beat. So here Alex is uh, playing some music and then it'll have different patterns. And, and the next thing they want to do is, uh, the next step up is to make it dance, actually, like dance and move the tentacles around and so forth. So, um, you know, that's the sort of thing that uh, students who've never programmed before, never done electronics before, didn't know anything about 3D printing or 3D design, um, can learn in one semester, actually more like half a semester. So I think that's like really cool stuff. Uh, and then here's, I'll show you, <laughs> Well, here's like a My Little Pony Santa Matron this kind of dude. Um, it's like trying to type, <laughs> not very well. Um, anyway, so that, that's just So here's here's probably the coolest thing. Um, and this isn't 3D printed, but we're working on. In fact, I think I printed around uh, uh, has around some of the 3D printed flutes. Uh, we're working on a design for a 3D print. Uh, sorry, not flute, but um, a recorder, like in middle school. And they sound really bad, I think, in general, just because recorders sound really bad, but um, we can do more sophisticated instruments once we get this working. So this is a Arduino-controlled robotic flute. Um, this, this, uh, who should I blame for the camera? Yeah, Me. Uh, so this big, big uh, wooden rig is, it holds everything in place, but one of the reasons we want a 3D printed design is that we can have the servo brackets right there on the design. So that's why I want 3D printing. And then here are some servo motors, and we're using this low, low temperature um, thermoplastic called polymorph that melts in hot water, and then you can mold it, and when it cools, it's just like regular plastic. It's very uh, um, tough, and you can sand it and drill it and everything. So um, they were able to play this flute that's got compressed air. We use a compressor for a, a mattress, like an air mattress, um, and they can now, they now have a robotic instrument they can play. And once again, you know, they did this basically in half a semester. So we're trying to revine, refine that design and iterate it, and we'll put that on Thinkiverse once we have something that's uh, working a little better. So uh, there are a bunch of other projects I can show you that we did uh, in this semester and last. So that's very exciting and very cool stuff. Okay, here's the moment of truth. Truth. We have uh, a whistle. Oh yeah, it's 
speaking of truth and truthiness, I guess you're going. Actually, uh, we'll. Oh, uh, is it we time? Have a, yeah, we have a keynote oh, okay. at three. So. All right, all right. So, time to go. Um, anyway, if anyone wants to check out this whistle, we should be able to break off the plastic ball and, and it should work. So, yeah, looks good to me. Anyway, that's three first.